I'm G4, and you're listening to the Beginner's Guide to Model Railroading, the exuberantly opinionated guide to the basic techniques of the world's greatest hobby. In this episode, now that you have trains running, I'll teach you how to make mountains, valleys, plains, and tunnels for your trains to run through. It's been quite a long time since I've wrote an episode script. I had episode 15 in the can for a while, but hadn't edited it. As COVID waxed and waned, science did not, and eventually I hit a streak of 49 consecutive days in lab without a break, including weekends. So, if for some idiotic reason you still have yet to be vaccinated or boosted, know that we molecular biologists pour our hearts and souls and lives into doing the best work that we can. If there is one benefit to COVID and this impromptu hiatus, it is that work on my own model railroad is moving quite along. As of this writing, I am just putting the first layer of dirt on, and as of this recording, wow, I've nearly finished all scenery and am deep into building structures. Additionally, the Penn State Model Railroad Club, of which I am the shadow controller of its puppet government, has reached a similar spot in the construction of our bend track modular switching and exhibition layout. So, in true BGT MRRING fashion, I need a better acronym, this means that I have just had direct experience with the things about which I now to you speak. Actually, okay, it's like confession. I've taken almost a full year off of building my own layout, as things have happened in the interim. Very briefly, a few years ago, I wrote the History of Railroading in North America episode, and as you may recall, I took a slight interlude of a few paragraphs to talk about how modern light rail transit and streetcars evolved from old-fashioned trolleys. Nearly everyone knows of old streetcars, nearly everyone is familiar with the decline and abandonment of nearly all old streetcars, and most people are familiar with light rail being a large and growing aspect of the modern cityscape, but surprisingly few, myself included at the time, know how those two tales actually connected to each other. For that episode, for those innocuous few paragraphs in comparison to what they spawned, I did a surprising amount of research and my interest was piqued. What happened next I usually describe as that I fell into a Wikipedia hole, broke my leg, and couldn't climb out. In my research, I discovered that light rail and modern transit is actually deeply intertwined with regular railroading, most systems usually having at least one segment where light rail runs immediately adjacent to freight railroad tracks. Having made this discovery, I felt compelled to share it far and wide to fellow modelers to spur interest in the topic and allow people to bring this otherwise ignored modeling subject to their home layouts or clubs. As of 2023, there are 60 modern transit systems in the United States and Canada, 7 legacy light rail, 22 modern light rail, 20 streetcar, and 11 DMU systems. Seriously, if there are 5 dozen systems running in 27 states and provinces, how in the world can nobody have thought to model them before now? So, to remedy this injustice, I made a presentation. At a mere 120 slides long in 45 minutes, it was a whirlwind of a show. I have currently presented it at NMRIX in 2021 and the Indie Junction Subnational in Indianapolis in 2022. In both cases, the presentation was extremely well received, but in both cases, it was also very poorly attended. Despite the fact that just a little under half of all slides were dedicated to showing that modern transit is intimately associated with things that people already model, Model, the pre-existing reputation of trolleys and transit being a separated discipline of modeling known for freight railroad independent layouts, and, let's be honest, a presentation title of Modeling Modern Transit Systems both worked against me. In an effort to yet further evangelize my discoveries, and timed with the release of the first model of a US prototype modern transit vehicle, the NCTD Sprinter from Pico with DCC and Sound, I designed a few switching railroad track plans and wrote an article on Diesel Multiple Unit Hybrid Rail, or DMUs for short, and was then promptly ghosted by both major model railroad magazine publishers. Boomers. So, what else to do but make a second presentation? This one much shorter, only 112 slides. 
As I speak, and after a full semester of polishing the PowerPoint in my spare time, to the detriment of both my own modeling and this podcast's three times a year release schedule, I will be presenting how passenger service is prototypical on small, modern switching layouts at the Amherst Railroad Society's Railroad Hobby Show in Springfield, Massachusetts, this January 28th and 29th, 2023, both days at 1330 in the Young Clinic Room. If you are attending the show, and if by some miracle I edit and publish this episode in time, I highly encourage you to stop by, say hi, and listen to what I have to say on the subject. I am absolutely positive that what I have discovered will impact the hobby forever, at least in some small way. Additionally, if you are that one person, I believe you are tall and had short blonde hair, who stopped me at Springfield all those years ago, I think it was 2018, saying that you liked my podcast and inspiring me to restart it, please do also stop by, as I didn't even catch your name, and I would like to thank you properly. But as pertaining to my own modeling, well... There's actually a third presentation. Between these three decks, I have over 350 slides of refined material in what I'm calling my Modern Modeling Anthology. I did not set out aiming to be an amateur PowerPointitian. I merely rose to the occasion I was given, and became one along the way. I'm still in the process of writing this one, but who knows, maybe you'll see me in Texas this summer at the NMRA National. I also don't want to give too much away, but if you go back and read through my free Patreon blog, you might be able to connect the dots and figure it out. For now, I'll leave you with what I believe to be the most scintillating clinic title ever, and possibly the apogee of what I am capable of bringing into this world. Proto-freelancing in the wrong direction, my accidental quest to model the near future. From just a few paragraphs of an episode script, I ran nearly the whole marathon of model railroading and, in sight of the finish line, face-planted and began walking back to the start. <sighs> anyway, you're here to learn about building layouts. Where did we leave off? We've just finished laying and wiring track, and hopefully in the time since then you've been able to polish it to be derailment-free. Unfortunately, this stage is where a lot of modelers will sometimes peter out, so much so that there's a term for a model railroad which is long established but thoroughly unscenic, a model of the Plywood Pacific Railroad. This often happens because the preceding steps were largely technical and precise, whereas the following are largely artistic and aesthetic. Some people have difficulty switching over to a more creative mindset, or are scared of messing up the radically different techniques with which they've had no previous experience. To this, I offer two remedies. The first one, as I'm sure you've heard before, is simply to not be afraid to try. We all need experience to do things well, and this is just as true of scenery as it is of benchwork. If you are truly worried your scenery will suck the first few times, you can always go back and scenic over it again with new dirt and plaster, or just tear the scenery out to the benchwork and start over. It's not that hard, I promise. The second solution, which I more often recommend, is to have a small test module to gain some experience before you start scenicing the layout proper. After all your benchwork and track laying, you most likely have a spare piece of flex track laying around and a rectangular-ish piece of plywood to put it on. Alternatively, if you have some foam coreboard lying around in preparation for scenery, you can easily cut a half-ish by meter-ish piece and lay some track straight on that. This trial module really doesn't have to be anything fancy or permanent, so you can quickly cobble it together from spare parts. The whole idea of having a trial module is such that you can test scenery techniques out ahead of time before you use them on the layout, giving yourself a low-stakes opportunity to tackle the learning curve. Literally, the worst thing that can happen if you mess things up that badly is that you take the whole module, put it in the garbage bin, and try again. If not, at the end of construction, then you have a nice, portable display for photographing outdoors or showing off at train shows or to coworkers. To be maximally useful, your trial module should probably have at least one of everything that you'd encounter on your main layout. So, most likely, one stretch of track, one building, one road, and, if applicable, one small water feature or rock outcropping. Try to build it exactly as you want things to look on your main layout. You can always build another module later of a different theme when you're a more experienced modeler. Okay, so, with that out of the way, let's talk about the specifics of modeling scenery. After much thought, I'll break this down into two episodes. Firstly, we'll cover all of the base construction, things like hills, valleys, and all the subsurface that supports later scenery, as well as rock outcroppings, because they fit well with the plasterwork of this stage. Then, in the next episode, I'll cover all the final visible layer of a layout, including dirt, grass, trees, and rivers. In thinking how to describe to you these two stages of scenery, I realize that nobody's come up with terms to distinguish them. So, taking a page from geology, I'll refer to them respectively as the lithosphere and pedosphere, deriving from the Latin prefixes for rock and dirt respectively. 
The first step in making scenery lithosphere, counterintuitively, involves going back to benchwork. The fascia is a covering on the edge of the layout that defines where the model railroad ends and the human one begins. While it has many additional functions, like hiding the shrapnel of the wiring process when you cut and resplice the same wire 20 different times to troubleshoot an electrical short, or for mounting turnout controls, waybill boxes, and shelves, the fascia is important to scenery because it reflects the layout contours around the trains, making it look like somebody sliced the trains out of an actual world that would have gone beyond the scope of the model had an aisleway not been placed there. If you have, for example, a layout built on a flat plywood sheet, what you most definitely do not want to do is bring all of the scenery right back down to the plywood base level at the edge of the layout. It's not absolutely necessary to have a fascia, and you can simply bring the lithosphere slice right up to the edge of the layout and paint it an unobtrusive color. This works especially well if you're using the extruded foam cake layering system I'll describe in a moment, or if the layout you're working on is more of a fast and loose precursor to a larger, better layout later. However, if you do wish to have a more professional looking layout that will stick around for longer, this would be the time to prepare for that. Additionally, the fascia is useful to attach things to, not just cup holders on the outside, but also lithosphere materials on the inside. Compared to everything you did in the benchwork phase, making fascia should be remarkably easy and the techniques familiar. Nearly everyone uses readily bendable MDF, or medium density fiber board, sometimes referred to by the brand name Masonite. MDF can be acquired from just about any lumberyard in 4x8 sheets, much like plywood. I usually have mine ripped into two foot wide strips for ease of transport and later maneuvering. You should start making the fascia by affixing a strip of MDF of appropriate width to the edge of your layout measured to the depth beyond the bottom of the benchwork you want the fascia to go. Having a fascia deeper than the layout benchwork will allow you more space on the front to mount things and allows you to affix a skirt behind the fascia to obscure anything beneath the layout, giving the layout underside a nice clean appearance while also serving as a place to store out of use tools. Actually affixing the fascia to the layout requires an extra set of hands or some creative sawhorsing. Start by marking a line along the back of the fascia at your desired depth beyond the benchwork, say 3 inches. Then lift the fascia up with your extra helper, hold it approximately in its final location, and find a way to hand the entire fascia board off to them. Going one attachment at a time, get down underneath the layout and peer behind the fascia, raising and lowering it until the benchwork meets up with that line you drew earlier. Periodically drill and screw the fascia to attachment points on the benchwork, which can be literally anywhere that the benchwork lumber extends to the layout edge and comes in contact with the fascia. Do not be afraid to let the fascia float freely away from the benchwork in a few locations to give the layout depth and a more aesthetic, freely flowing, curving appearance. You can also extend the fascia's depth away from the layout with benchwork extensions. When the fascia has been securely attached, you'll have a large rectangular baffle obscuring most of your layout from view. Using a marker, draw freehand a line along the fascia representing how you want the terrain to be contoured, i.e. if the track goes into a tunnel, draw a mountainy shape that goes above track level. If the track bridges a valley, draw a valley -y shape beneath it. Once you've drawn a contour to your satisfaction, use a jigsaw to cut the fascia down and reveal your layout again. If you're worried, you can always undercut and come back later for a second pass with a jigsaw or a sanding tool to bring the fascia down to its precisely desired contour. It also helps to work in smaller sections, cutting down only a meter or so at a time. This allows you to more easily check that your freehand contour line matches what's behind it before you make a permanent cut by peering around a small corner, as well as shrinking the scrap pieces to a more manageable size for the recycling bin. Incidentally, if you're wanting to build a backdrop for your layout, you can do so during this step using much the same methodology. Attach a two or three foot deep strip of masonite to vertical cantilevers rising up from the back of the benchwork lattice at the desired locations. You can also use the backdrop to hide the track by cutting small holes for the track to run through, and then later obscuring those holes with trees, overpasses, or other scenic foils. Just make sure, and this is really important, that all the tracks behind the backdrop are still accessible to rescue unforeseen derailments. For both the backdrop and the fascia, if you have a stretch longer than 8 feet, you can splice MDF boards together. Using scrap dimensional lumber, find a piece wide enough to attach both boards to, but not so thick as to prevent their bendability. Then screw and glue the pieces together, letting them dry overnight. Especially for the backdrop, use flush head screws for the splice, and cover the screw heads and splice joint with spackle to be sanded smooth when dried. This will make the joint practically invisible once everything is painted. When all of this is done, paint your backdrop blue and add any scenery or photographs you want, but wait to paint the fascia because it will get very messy in the coming months.
With the fascia mounted, we can now focus on the terrain building techniques proper. Probably the oldest way of building the layout lithosphere isn't too different from fascia and benchwork. During the hobby's nascency, landforms were created by cutting plywood cross-sections for the terrain and attaching them to the benchwork periodically, then using a staple gun to affix a fine mesh chicken wire to the plywood before covering that with paper mache. While chicken wire can still be useful to create lightweight but strong landforms above shallow areas, such as above hidden trackage, this methodology is far more crude than necessary. With time and technology, the next terrain system to emerge was cardboard webbing. Using a retractable safety knife, you can cut extra cardboard boxes into long strips a few centimeters wide. Importantly, take the strips and run them along a table edge to crush the lattice inside and make them more flexible. Then, use a hot glue gun to attach longitudinal strips from the back of the layout to the sub-roadbed, then to the front of the layout. Finally, thread additional cardboard strips laterally, affixing them to the longitudinal pieces again with a hot glue gun. As the lattice develops, you can modify the landscape contours by cutting and splicing the individual strips to add or take in slack. When finalized, the webbing is covered in plaster cloth, to be discussed momentarily, as an initial layer, then a thicker layer of plaster, hydrocal, or sculpt mold ibid, is added to increase strength and take in the sags of the plaster cloth. Like the chicken wire method, this has the advantage of being hollow, but for much less weight and effort. An alternative, additional, and absurdly cheap method of landforming can be achieved by balling up newsprint and taping piles of these balls into loose shapes of a hill, then also covering them with plaster cloth and proceeding as above. But this is such a rudimentary technique that I shan't discuss it more here. Just know that it's available if you're really in a pinch and don't care too much about the exact shape of your hill. However, if there is one thing that these three landforming techniques might be missing, it would be finesse. You can't exactly have a very fine-grained control of the shape of a hill and valley when you're using floppy cardboard to say nothing of the detailing capabilities of power tools and staple guns. It is thus that, in the past few decades, the standard material of scenery construction has become that of extruded foam insulation board. As the name implies, this material is available in large sheets of varying thickness, used primarily as wall insulation during construction. The sheets are prepared by extrusion, as opposed to the expanded bead foams you are more likely familiar with. Think less Dixie cups and more foam takeout containers. The extrusion process not only increases the strength of the board, but also allows it to be attacked with a knife or sander without falling apart into its component beads, leading to an unrealistic bubbly appearance of the terrain. However, some modelers, including myself, use the two types of foam interchangeably. Since the product is most often available in pink, blue, and more rarely green, it is usually referred to as bracket your color of choice close bracket foam. Modelers have taken to foam board because it allows much finer control over the shape of the landscape. Initially, shaping was done with knives and rasps, but such is excruciatingly messy. In the intervening years, a number of tools have developed, centering around the hot knife through butter concept. Hot wires, hot sticks, and hot knives can all make quick work of a block of foam, allowing you to carve out the exact shape of the landscape you desire. There are two camps for the preparation of foam board landscaping. Many people use cake layers, where you simply stack one board on top of another, each of decreasing size, until you hit the top of the hill. However, some modelers orient the slices vertically, like a loaf of bread. These two systems can obviously be used on the same layout, and to some extent are fully interchangeable, but each has a slight aptitude for different situations. When you start to reach a critical volume of hill, it becomes exceedingly expensive to supply foam to the interior of the hill, which isn't strictly necessary for structural integrity. As such, the bread slice method allows you to limit weight and waste by carving out and saving for later use the interior portions of the foam before each piece is attached. Thus, cake layering is best for broader, lower hills, and bread slicing is better for more vertical and linear hills like when a railroad is snaking along a river valley. In either case, the way you go about building foam board hills is to make a large piece with the approximate shape of the hill layer or slice, cut it with a hot wire tool, then test fit the piece, make minor adjustments, and glue it in place with the same foam-safe caulk gun adhesive that you used for track laying. You should always cut the pieces to be oversized, then, when the entire hillside is completed and dried, cut the hill down to its final shape. By waiting to finalize the hill shape until all the pieces are in place, you will both have a more accurate view of the hill as a whole instead of guessing what it will look like with only a portion of the pieces there, as well as be able to render the layer or slice seams practically invisible. An important side note, the hot wire tools usually do not cut very well through dried glue, so try to keep the glue beads as far away from any places you expect to cut when assembling the foam board layers. Now, let's talk tools.
As aforementioned, there are three types of foam cutting tools. The most common in the hobby is the hot wire cutter. This is a letter U or letter C shaped cutter with a very thin wire reaching between the tines. Though the thin wire heats up quickly and makes fine cuts, I personally dislike hot wire cutters because the wire breaks very frequently and the size of the cut that you make is limited by the depth and breadth of the tines. If your tines are, say, 6 inches deep, then making a 10 inch hill would require multiple separate pieces to be terminally prepared before final gluing. Additionally, you can never cut starting from the middle of a piece of foam, you must always begin at the edge. To get around this limitation, you can use a hot stick, sometimes confusingly called a hot knife. A hot stick is simply that, with a single-ended stick about the diameter of a pen ink cartridge. In retrospect, I have no idea what I was doing to inspire me when I wrote this simile. This setup is superior because it allows you to make any conceivable cut without the U-shaped tines getting in the way, as well as make any cut as deep as the stick is long. However, as useful as hot sticks may be, they are often aimed at light-duty floristry tasks and made very, very cheaply, breaking almost as frequently as the hot wire cutter, but at a higher repair or replacement cost. Honestly, one of the best purchases I have ever made in the hobby, besides a handheld reciprocating saw, is that of a hot knife proper. Though these can run from $70 to $140, a far cry from the $20 of a hot wire cutter, a hot knife is not too dissimilar from a lightsaber. Imagine a large, industrial steak knife with a slit up the middle and a bulky, triggering handle capable of blasting 1.21 gigawatts down the blade to make it cut through the very fabric of time and space along with any ill-fated foam coreboard that may be in the way. A good hot knife is a worthy investment that will turn you into a high-speed sculptor of landscapes, a moran of mountains, a trumble of terrain, and innis of... well, you get the picture. So, in sum, the way to make landforms goes thusly. Determine if cake layers or bread slices are more relevant for a particular area. Use a hot knife to cut a slice of foam board roughly to shape. Test fit the foam piece and trim as necessary, but make sure to keep its proportions slightly oversized. Glue the foam to the layout or adjacent foam pieces. Keep the glue bead away from the places you plan to cut later. Use long metal pins to hold the pieces together while drying. And finally, when all the foam pieces are dried and glued together, remove the pins, cut them down to their final shapes, and make a seamless scenery base. Now, before we move on to other topics, here are a few more odds and ends regarding lithosphere construction. First, as you go along cutting the pieces to size, you'll end up with a lot of scrap foam pieces and odd shapes. Don't immediately throw them away, keep the larger pieces handy in case you can cut another piece from it. However, be sure not to hoard these small pieces indefinitely. Keep them in a spare empty box as you accumulate them, and then immediately throw the box in the trash when you're finished landscaping. Seriously, hoarding is very tempting at this step. Secondly, if you have a tabletop railroad with a track sitting on the foam base, you can also use your hot knife to cut into the base and have below track scenery. Also be sure to avoid having any areas outside of man-made structures perfectly flat, and take care to add at least occasional below-grade terrain features. Having a railroad with an artificially flat base is highly unrealistic, even for the Midwest. Seriously, go to a river if you live there, you'll see what I'm talking about. And lastly, if you ever have any questions at all about what hills look like, research the geology of your setting and go on a hike. Nothing beats getting out into the actual woods to see how nature does it. Even if you're mostly modeling urban territory, take a walk through town. Not a drive, a walk. A walking audit is the best way to soak up the world's details. And don't just walk along Main Street, either. Walk around buildings to their backs, ramble through parking lots and alleys, take a look at the viewing angles you'd see a city from on your model railroad, and explore places from that perspective. See how the city grew up around and eventually over small rivers and creeks. Look at historic images showing the city under construction. A surprising amount of human infrastructure is controlled by a place's immediate terrain, and there is no substitute for understanding that than the real world itself. Have fun, get outside, go on an adventure. Now, one common misconception of foam board lithogenesis is that the foam acts as the direct layout surface. While it is entirely possible to build a model railway this way, there are two key limitations to this methodology. Firstly, no matter how precisely we may affix our foam, there will still always be a small gap or an abrupt transition from foam to, say, plywood. More importantly, however, is that the foam remains fragile. Dropping a tool here or a stray elbow there may result in a large gash of pink or blue splitting an otherwise verdant green hillside. And finally, if you want to make any delicate terrain features, such as tire ruts or very small hills or dirt piles, replicating such in foam is incredibly arduous, if not impossible.
In light of these issues, modelers often return to the techniques of the purely quote-unquote hard shell scenery techniques described above, and coat their scenery base with some type of plaster product. This serves as a form of protection for the layout against damage, as well as a sculpting medium to precisely control the shape of the final hillside. Before we get into the specifics, let's have a history lesson. By far the most common material used for scenery shells is gypsum, sometimes known by the brand name Hydrocal, but usually understood as Plaster of Paris, or simply Plaster. Plaster is derived from a deceptively simple molecule, calcium sulfate, or CaSO4, and is the same stuff you find in chalk, some sandstones, fertilizers, White Sands National Monument, and even exceptionally hard tap water. What makes it notable is that, when dehydrated, it crystallizes, effectively becoming an on-demand rock crystal of whatever shape it happens to dry in. The name Plaster of Paris comes from notable mines, unsurprisingly, in the North Parisian neighborhood of Montmartre. Montmartre? Eh. Yeah. Known for being quite hilly and rich in gypsum. The process of making plaster is, similarly, quite easy. Historic oceans dry up or deposit a thick layer of sulfates, leaving chalky strata. Mine the stratum, crush it to a fine powder, dry it in a kiln, and voila! Plaster has been used as a building material and mortar for centuries, dating back to the Romans and Egyptians. With time, people discovered that it could be cast into molds, sometimes creating elaborate statues. In the mid-1700s, Johann Friedrich Meyer, a South German pastor whom would today be recognized as an early agricultural scientist, discovered that gypsum could be used as a miracle fertilizer, which led to the minuscule plaster war of the 1820s, once American farmers illegally smuggled Nova Scotian gypsum into the growing Midwest. <clears throat> Moving closer to modern uses, plaster was first used to set broken bones in the early 1800s in Europe, but by thoroughly encasing the limb in a plaster concretion. Due to the extreme weight and bulk, these casts were immobilizing. In 1839, a Mr. Oh, God, I'm going to butcher this. G. V. Lefergue of Saint Emilion, France incidentally also the inventor of the hypodermic needle was the first doctor to set a broken bone in a cast of plaster of paris applied to linen strips and hence we have plaster cloth plaster impregnated gauze or more simply plaster cloth is the most basic element of a hard shell scenery usually coming in a roll you take a desired length cut it to size dip it in water and drape it over a hillside if you're using plaster cloth exclusively for your hard shell you should lay the pieces with a 50 percent overlap as in the next piece of cloth covers half the previous one and thoroughly rub in the plaster to smooth out the hillside however using plaster cloth alone does not allow for the fine detail textures and the weave of the gauze can still show through as such, many people prefer to use straight plaster, sands the cloth, and apply it directly to the hillside, whereupon you can smooth it out to be generic hillsides, or carve it after a few minutes with sculpting tools to be rocks or road ruts. I prefer a hybrid approach. Plaster cloth does have the advantage of becoming a solid base where there was none before, which is very useful for covering gaps too small for a spare foam piece. Additionally, depending on the type of foam you're using, the plaster cloth can add some tooth to the foam, making it easier for subsequent plaster layers to adhere. The next modification I use, which is now the dominant scenery material in the hobby, is Sculptamold. Very similar to plaster, Sculptamold also includes paper mache and clay, making it much stiffer and more likely to hold its shape when wet. It is also lumpier, which adds to the degree of realism of a randomly undulating hillside. To actually make the hard shell, since I use both plaster cloth and Sculptamold, I only cover the foam with one layer of plaster cloth, and then I mix up the Sculptamold per directions and start applying it by hand or spatula. Since this can be a very messy process, I sometimes wear an apron and usually have one clean hand holding the Sculptamold bowl or bucket and one dirty hand, which reaches into the bowl and applies it to the layout. The most important thing to do at this stage, more important than anything else in this episode, is to cover all of the layout's track with masking tape prior to doing anything with plaster. Plaster, plaster cloth, and Sculptamold all can drip when wet, and these plaster droplets can leave small white craters wherever they fall. If this falls onto a tie, it will have veins of white that are hard to scrub out. If they fall onto a railhead, it can dirty the track and impair electrical connectivity. And worst of all, if the plaster drops onto a turnout, it can obstruct flangeways or freeze the throw bar. Thus, before you do anything on your layout involving plaster, grab a roll of painters or masking tape and cover every inch of exposed track and also all of the hidden track beneath areas where you will be applying plaster in the event that any of it leaks through the surface. <laughs> 
The final aspect of lithosphere construction to address is that of rock molds. Though they technically will be part of the outward-facing surface layer of the scenery, and may thus be better classified as part of the pedosphere, model rock faces are cast in plaster, and therefore more appropriately discussed here. The first step to making rock casts is to acquire a rock mold. Most often, reasonably realistic molds can be purchased in great variety from any old hobby shop, but this sometimes makes rock outcroppings recognizable across different pikes, destroying the illusion for the trained eye. To increase rock face variety, some people use room temperature vulcanizing rubber to make their own casts of real rocks. This can be useful and realistic, but it is also well beyond the realm of beginnerhood. A unique and intermediate option is to make one-off casts of individual rocks using, well, simply, Play-Doh. This allows a beginning modeler to acquire unique rock shapes with minimal effort. There are three main ways to make rock outcroppings for your model railroad. The first and most common and most traditional method is to cast the rocks independently of the layout and then apply them later. For casting, you can use the same plaster or hydrocal mix that you used before on the lithosphere landforming step, but not sculpt mold, and maybe mixed a little thicker. Just follow the directions for casting. You will usually have to do some trial and error to find a balance between making your rocks chocolatey crumble and so dense as to be less carvable than depleted uranium. With the plaster mixed, let it sit for a few seconds and start to set while you prepare the molds. To do so, take the molds and coat them with a release agent. Most people prefer to use so-called wet water, which is water in a spray bottle with a few drops of dish detergent to destroy the surface tension. I myself prefer isopropanol. Once this is done, set the molds in a stable place such as to remain flat, such as a box with crumpled up newspaper or a scrunched up towel. Importantly, make sure that this place either has a towel underneath it or is easy to clean in the event of a spill or a leak. Now, pour the plaster into the rock mold, and be sure to do this carefully as to not introduce any bubbles into the plaster. And, once the mold is filled, give it a few hard knocks or a swirl with a stick so as to release any bubbles that may have gotten through and attach themselves to the mold surface. Then let it dry overnight. A day or two later, when no longer cold or damp to the touch, gently peel away the rock mold from the plaster. If it sticks too hard to the mold, use more mold release agent next time. If there are too many bubbles on the rock face, be more careful in mixing and pouring the plaster and use less release agent. And if you break any of the casts when releasing them, don't immediately throw them away, as you can probably still use the smaller fragments elsewhere on the layout. Seriously, don't panic if you don't get it right the first time. Casting rocks will always be a process of trial and error until you get a cast that you like and can use on the layout. Do not be afraid to smash an improperly cast rock to get rid of the faulty areas and salvage a usable section from it. To apply the rocks to the layout, you should first test fit the casting where you want it to go. Sometimes it's shallow enough that you can glue it straight to the layout, but more often the casting is deeper than desired. In this case, you can either cut away the back of the casting with a dremel or hammer and chisel, or, much more commonly, you can cut away at the plaster lithosphere of the layout and hack back the foam underneath until the casting fits how you want it. If instead you're using cardboard webbing or chicken wire, here's a nifty trick. Since cutting away the layout surface behind leaves a big, gaping, unsupported hole, you can use masking tape to create a webbed cradle in the hole that supports the rock casting exactly how you want it. In either case, once the rock casting is applied, you can go back with freshly mixed plaster to fill in any gaps and seamlessly blend the rock in with the surrounding countryside. Whereas this method of rock casting is to create the rock casts first, then integrate them into the layout, an alternative and almost equally popular methodology is to cast the rocks directly onto the layout. Once the mold is filled with plaster and starting to set for 10 to 20 minutes, some modelers turn the mold right side up and stick it directly onto the hillside where they want the rock to go. At this point, the plaster should be congealed enough that the mold sticks in place. You can then peel the mold off the next day. This strategy has several advantages and disadvantages. Firstly, it significantly simplifies the act of integrating the rock into the layout, because, well, it dries in its final location. Additionally, this also allows you to bend the mold to perfectly conform to the hill's shape. However, if the casting's face contains bubbles or imperfections, the rock will be stuck to the layout and can only be removed with moderate difficulty. Also, because of the depth of the molds, this method won't allow you to butt one casting right up against another, leaving a gap between the rock formations. Lastly, there's always the chance that plaster could drip all over your layout if you're not careful. So, in taking these two methods together, each has their own aptitudes and failings. Evaluate their use on a case-by-case -case basis. Otherwise, one solid conclusion I do have to offer is that you shouldn't try casting a rock directly onto your layout until you already have successfully made a few independent, disposable casts first.
The third method of making rock faces is actually a more modern development. Some manufacturers now offer flexible rock faces made of rubber, foam, or latex. These come in large, highly detailed sheets and can very simply be cut to size with a pair of scissors and glued directly to the layout. The sheer size of flexible rock faces makes them an excellent choice for large or long cliff faces, rock cuts, or anything similar. Additionally, many of these manufacturers also offer flexible retaining walls, stone walls, and tunnel linings, so flexible sheets make a very quick, easy, and realistic solution to large areas of vertical terrain. Before we move on, here are a few final tips in casting rocks. When it comes to mixing plaster for the casting, you have to be fairly diligent in your recipe. Make sure it is not too watery and that it has at least enough consistency to hold the shape of a ripple for a few seconds as you drag a tool through it. If the plaster is too soupy, the casting will end up very chalky and non-dense, being very prone to breaking or rubbing off as a fine powder and making it very difficult to maintain fine detail. At the more extreme end, watery plaster, as it dries, will contract within the mold asymmetrically, cracking and leaving many smaller, unusable pieces. Another note, if you're racking up a bunch of broken pieces of plaster or failed castings, you don't need to throw them all away and can somewhat recycle them. However, if you try breaking them down and remixing them with fresh plaster, the resulting mixture will not flow properly into the rock mold, and the finished casting will result in a somewhat weird-looking impressionistic take on a rock. What I recommend instead is to use new plaster to mostly coat the interior surface of the mold, and then you can put some of the broken pieces in as filler material in the back end of the casting, topping off the rest of the mold with more fresh plaster. If you do this, again, make sure to avoid using large chunks of plaster which could asymmetrize the speed of drying and cause the whole casting to crack. Filler pieces should be broken down to the size of small gravel beforehand. In all cases for adding rocks, once the main casting or foam piece is dried and glued to the layout in its final location, you should go back and mix up one more batch of plaster, then start filling in the gaps around the castings to seamlessly integrate them with each other and with the rest of the layout. To hold the carving better, this plaster should be a little bit of a thicker mixture than what you used for the casting itself, and you should wait about 10 minutes for it to start curing. The idea here is that the plaster isn't meant to flow into all the niches of a casting, but rather it should hold its shape and allow you to carve it. Gently spoon the plaster into the gaps of interest, make sure to use only just as much as you need and that the excess doesn't pour onto the rest of the casting, and then use an old X-Acto knife or a sharp point to carve and scrape shapes that match the adjoining castings to seamlessly carry geologic features across the whole outcropping. You don't need to fill every crack in, and if there is a sufficiently charismatic looking break that looks like a stress fracture in a real rock, feel free to leave it in. If you are interested, you can actually use this method to make an entire rock outcropping bespoke, but most people prefer casts or real rocks to evoke the minute detail that a hand carving couldn't achieve. The final step in making rocks is to color them. Woodland Scenics and other manufacturers offer a variety of rock color washes, but watered down acrylic paint will also do. For both, it's always better to have a more diluted wash, because you can always come back and add more color later, but you cannot remove a color once it's added. The color wash can be added with a small sponge, but a large paintbrush might be more helpful for some castings to get in deep cracks. When coloring rocks, it helps to work from a prototype. If you have a specific real-world area in mind, try going there and digging in the ground for some desired examples that you can bring home with you and set on the layout next to the casting as you color it. Otherwise, internet pictures will do. The preferred way to color rocks is to start with the lighter colors first. Don't completely cover the rock face with each color. Rather, as you go, layer by layer, use a spotted leopard technique, having a few blotches of different colors here and there overtopping one another in different patterns. Depending on what you're modeling, the rock should generally have a base color that you augment with these different hues at different spots. You should absolutely start by first practicing coloring on spare or broken rock pieces off layout before you do anything to the permanently affixed rock work. It should also be noted here that different adhesives, notably glue and scenic cement, will actually clog up the porosity of a rock casting, making it very difficult to add color in that particular spot. This can be fixed by directly painting over the problem spot with full strength paint, but it's much better to prevent the need for this by being careful to avoid letting glues touch the front of the rock casting in the first place, and by waiting to apply scenery and ground cover in the area until after the casting has been colored. There are two final things that you should do to finish off the rock casting, and they can be boiled down to giving the rock shadows and highlights. First, give the whole thing a wash with India ink. 
Unlike the acrylic washes, India ink should be dissolved in rubbing alcohol, and it should be even more diluted. Washing the entire rock face will do several things. First, it will unify all the different color splotches with a similar hue. Second, it will pool into flat areas and leave behind darker stains, exactly like water would do in the real world. And third, it will wick into all the nooks and crannies of the casting, making all the details pop, and simulating the smaller shadows achievable with harsh sunlight not present in even layout room lighting. The final step to rock coloring is to highlight the sharp edges. If you've ever scraped anything over a rock, you'll notice that it leaves behind a bright white chalky dust on the scrape. Since this most often occurs on the edges and corners of real rocks, you can simulate this by dry brushing the colored casting. Put a very small amount of white paint on a paintbrush, then use a paper towel to wipe effectively all of the paint back off the brush. Gently drag the brush over the most exposed and sharp edges of the casting, and voila, it now looks like a real rock. Do this less on natural outcroppings, and more where railroad builders would have chipped away at a rock with picks and axes. Also, no need to add more paint. You can recharge the brush straight from the paper towel. And with that, we've covered all the aspects of constructing the lithosphere of a model railroad. Part of why I make the lithosphere-pedosphere distinction is obviously because one comes under the other, but also because the colors and materials in this section are intense, unrealistic, and messy. If you spend a long time making a small farmer's field, then accidentally spill plaster on it when making a nearby rock, you will have wasted all of your hard work. So, while not a hard and fast rule, try to wait on making the pedosphere until you've finished all the lithosphere, or at least as best you can, keep any finished scenery far away from active construction zones. I hope that, in this episode, I have given you many techniques to transform your Plywood Pacific into a pike with rolling hills and dramatic rock faces. Next episode, I'll tell you how to bring your layout to life with dirt, grasses, bushes, and trees. If you have a question or comment or want to join the Facebook community, even though I don't check it because I've given up on social media, would like to make a donation, or would like to learn more, please visit the show's website at bgtmrring.org. If you like the show, please give a good review on iTunes and subscribe to the podcast feed. If you do not like the show, do not say anything and contemplate the thought crime you have committed. This podcast was written, recorded, and produced on the ancestral lands of the Susquehannock tribe. I would like to thank them for their historical stewardship of central Pennsylvania. And now, as your reward for listening through my closing spiel, your modeler's vocabulary word for this episode is... Doubling a hill. When a train is too heavy to make it over a hill and no helpers are available, half the train will be taken up the hill to the next passing siding, then the locomotive will return down the hill to retrieve the second half. Thank you for listening, and happy modeling.